Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle CIO Leadership Forum. My name is Vicki Lambranskill with Argyle. It's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our esteemed speaker. First, a quick reminder to please stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. During today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page. And to ask questions throughout this session, simply type into the Q&A chat and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Catherine Quinlan, Vice President of AI Ethics at IBM. We're excited to have Catherine with us for our keynote presentation titled, Practical Guidance to Manage Privacy and AI Governance. Welcome, Catherine, over to you. Thank, thank you, Vicki, and uh, I just want to say I'm really delighted to be here today to speak to this audience. Uh, before I, I delve into my presentation, I just wanted to uh, just share an opening remark or two. 2023 was a pivotal year around AI. AI and thoughts around uh, responsible AI really became hot topics, not only across government and industry, but also society in general. And this may be uh, may have been a new topic for many, uh, but at IBM, uh, we have been focusing on responsible AI for over 10 years. Uh, back in 2013, IBM Research was experimenting with AI and uh, discovered that bias could show up in the results and really concerned about the impact rate right, that might have on adoption of uh, this technology. Uh, they created a board to guide AI development. And in 2019, that board was moved out of research uh, into the Chief Privacy Office, uh, which was given responsibility for AI ethics for the entire company. And in today's presentation, uh, I'm going to share with you some of the things we're doing uh, at IBM around responsible AI, and hopefully uh, some uh, key takeaways for your organization. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn to the first slide. So, here in the first slide, I, I would just say in the era of generative AI, really customer trust is more essential than ever. Uh, generative AI has really changed what's possible with technology, uh, and that speed of innovation uh, continues. And uh, generative AI is really capable of so many things uh, that would benefit uh, both society and businesses. Uh, but generative AI presents uh, presents certain risks, so it is important. Uh, it's designed and uh, implemented and used uh, responsibly. And this next slide, uh, I, I've captured some of the benefits of generative AI. Uh, it can perform complex tasks uh, very quickly, uh, can increase productivity, can represent shorter time to value. And uh, for those uh, on today's call, right, that have uh, been using uh, generative AI like ChatGPT or uh, other uh, similar forms of generative AI, I, I, I'm certain you can see uh, how that potential is for increasing productivity and performing complex tasks. But I would also say that generative AI and AI in general, it carries potential risks. And some of these, some of these are risks that exist with other forms of AI, but some um, some are new risks and amplified risks. And I think one example I would just share with this audience, and this is uh, something there's there's been a certain amount of coverage and press around, is, is the risk of hallucination, hallucination from uh, generative AI. And that, when you think about it in its simplest form, uh, that's when uh, you're using generative AI uh, and the response is generated uh, in a way that it's presented as factual, but it actually uh, contains false or misleading information. And that, uh, that is a known risk of generative AI, and there have been uh, some pretty well-publicized, um, you know, examples of hallucination uh, that ha have occurred. So here, again, uh, AI, generative AI offers many be benefits, but uh, carries potential risk. And I will share with you that um, at IBM, uh, during 2023, as part of our AI ethics board work streams, we did release a paper uh, on foundation models uh, and uh, the risks, uh, the risks and benefits of foundation models. Uh, turning to the next slide, so 
here at IBM, and this is uh, part of uh, my role at IBM, uh, we've, uh, we've taken a multi uh, layered approach uh, to AI ethics, and uh, part of that approach uh, is that we've created uh, principles uh, for trust and transparency, as well as pillars of trust. And uh, I'll just go through the principles. Uh, you know, the purpose of AI is to augment, not replace human intelligence. Uh, data and insights belong to their creator. Uh, new technology, including AI systems, must be transparent and explainable. And as I go through some of the later slides, uh, you know, I just uh, want to emphasize, right, these principles and pillars of trust uh, that we've put into place really uh, provide guidance as we look at uh, and evaluate uh, both not just the deployment of AI, but also uh, the development of AI. So here, you know, again, our principles and pillars and focus. Uh, you know, we have a multi-dimensional approach at IBM uh, to AI. Uh, it includes uh, governance, uh, ethics by design, uh, tools, uh, client zero experience. So our client zero experience is IBM uh, and how we are implementing uh, AI and also uh, our leadership uh, and partnerships that we, um, we've developed. So uh, at IBM, we have uh, this, we have a policy advisory board um, and the policy advisory board is really, uh, I would say, comprised of uh, our CEO, uh, Armin Krishna, and also senior vice presidents of IBM. Uh, and they set uh, IBM's top level policy vision, uh, including our policies for tech ethics and privacy. So uh, when you think about how we approach uh, AI ethics at IBM, we have the PAC uh, at the top of the triangle, and underneath it we have an AI ethics board at IBM. And uh, certainly I, other companies I'm, I'm sure have similar uh, kinds of, uh, whether they call it a steering committee um, or some other governance mechanism. But at IBM, we call it the AI Ethics Board. Uh, and that's really uh, the group that's at the heart of our ethical decision making. Um, it was established uh, in 2018 to define a strategy that it uh, executes on the PAC's vision uh, for tech ethics and privacy. And it's, it's made up of uh, really representatives, uh, executives from across our business. So uh, that could include consulting, um, it would include uh, our software side of the business, um, you know, different support functions. And, and the purpose of that is really to get um, diversity in thinking around AI issues. And uh, the AI Ethics Board, right, uh, we meet very regularly. Uh, in certain cases, we actually, uh, the AI Ethics Board actually reviews certain use cases of AI that are being proposed. Uh, it also manages uh, certain work streams, like for example, again, the point of view around risks, um, risks and benefits uh, from foundation models um, and how to mitigate them. And underneath, again, continuing down the triangle, we have IBM's business units. And uh, again, we really have a pretty uh, robust uh, framework uh, around AI. So within each business unit of IBM, uh, there have been uh, AI ethics focal points uh, appointed, as well as business unit privacy leaders. And with respect to the focal points, um, they, they really play a very important role. They uh, really are first line of defense uh, when it comes to use case review. Uh, they also, are, again, if there's guidance that comes out from the AI Ethics Board, uh, they are responsible for making sure that others within the business unit are aware of and adhere to that guidance. So uh, I am going to spend a moment uh, or a few minutes on use case reviews because that also uh, is part of the framework that IBM has set up uh, with respect to its approach to AI ethics and governance. So uh, at IBM, uh, we have provided 
uh, pretty, uh, what I would say, pretty robust guidance uh, to our business units uh, in terms of how to evaluate uh, proposed uh, use cases of AI. And uh, here in this slide, I'm just going to take you through uh, how a use case uh, might come in and the review that would, it would undergo. So uh, the first step would be uh, a potential tech ethics risk would be spotted. Uh, and a use case review would be initiated. And this is where the AI eth ethics focal point uh, would come in. Um, they would complete an initial review of the use case within the business unit. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, the use case, perhaps uh, the use case could just be modified a little bit or uh, a guardrail implemented, uh, and then it would be uh, able to go forward. Uh, but sometimes uh, further review is needed. And we, again, have provided guidance to the business on the types of use cases uh, that would need to come into the AI ethics project office uh, for further review. And uh, if, that, uh, if that would occur, then the CPO, the chief privacy office, would review the use case, uh, defining guardrails to implement, or we might, in certain cases, recommend further review by the AI ethics board. Um, so, you know, I would emphasize that, you know, probably a very small number of actual use cases go to the AI ethics board, uh, but, but certain use cases do, and uh, the board would be convened, we'd review the use case, uh, and the AI ethics board may define uh, guardrails that would have to be implemented before it moved forward. And then it would circle back uh, to the AI ethics focal point, uh, who would work with the business to implement the guardrails. Uh, here, I'm just going to spend a moment on this. So this this would be an example or sample uh, use case review and the outcome. Uh, in this particular example, um, it would be using AI to aggregate product safety uh, and maintenance data to fully automate safety reviews and determine required maintenance uh, action. So here, again, when you think back to one of the earlier slides, it talked about some of the risks uh, of generative AI, and uh, here the potential risks, right, would be fully automation, full automation of the safety review and the lack of human review and decision making, uh, even when the confidence threshold is met. Um, so that that is a very, like when you're talking about things like safety uh, from, from where I sit, it would be important, uh, in fact, that there would be a human in the loop. And uh, a case like this um, would be revised uh, to, in fact, use AI to aggregate data and make recommendations and predict predictions for a subject matter expert to review and validate. And that, that really um, uses the strengths of AI, right, to aggregate and perhaps uh, parse, parse through uh, a lot of data, but then when, uh, you know, the recommendations were made, right, then in essence, there would be a human in the loop uh, to really uh, evaluate the aggregated data and uh, use discretion uh, to determine which products require maintenance and what actions to take. Uh, another, uh, another thing that's been implemented at IBM uh, really, this is part of, uh, again, the process of uh, evaluating uh, systems and whether further review is, is needed is um, called the algorithmic impact assessment. And really, this is a two-step process. Uh, so there is a, a short, shorter gatekeeping questionnaire, uh, right, to determine whether a system is in scope. Um, you know, and I, I think I, I'm just going to pause there and say I think this particular point, right, is important, and, and you'll see this in the later slides that, you know, AI regulation uh, is accelerating around the world, uh, and compliance, um, you know, is is complex uh, with that regulation. So an AIA is really, um, you know, really a part of. Uh, a part of that process. And uh, again, so there would be an, a shorter gate, gatekeeping questionnaire um, and then uh, an evidence questionnaire, right, which is an assessment to, de 
to gather relevant compliance details about in-scope AI and algorithmic systems. Right? So this is really um, assessing the potential impact uh, and governance requirements of uh, algorithmic systems uh, throughout IDF. I just want to pause for a moment, too, in terms of uh, ethics by design, right? So we also at IBM have an ethics by design uh, process. Um, you know, we may be different than some of the other organizations that are represented on this call today in that IBM is both uh, a company that creates uh, AI products as well as deploys AI products. So uh, ethics by design uh, describes the methods, tools, and best practices uh, that we implement to mitigate potential risks and help align our systems, um, align our systems with regulatory requirements. So here, um, you know, in terms of uh, ethics by design, uh, I, I think there's three things that I would mention, right? The focus of ethics by design is, right, uh, a methodology. Uh, and this slide does cover the methodology, which really defines the recommended tools and best practices uh, for uh, practitioners to follow. And then also uh, there's an adoption aspect to uh, ethics by design, right? How is that methodology going to be put into practice? Uh, and then a governance aspect as well, uh, defining the rules, responsibilities, uh, and control points, right, to promote uh, and also uh, evaluate to make sure uh, the methodology has been implemented. So at IBM, we actually have a corporate directive uh, that uh, defines, uh, that directs IBMers to follow the ethics by design methodology uh, and also the use case uh, practice. So uh, in a sense, again, I had mentioned that we have a multi-dimensional, multi-layered approach to AI ethics and uh, ethics by design. Uh, is an important, uh, important piece of that. I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, just to uh, talk about privacy, um, privacy and AI laws. Right? So really, uh, here, you know, there's on the privacy front, I would say uh, there's so many laws around the world related to privacy. Um, and, you know, AI regulations uh, are coming and uh, in some cases are already here. So uh, just one uh, discrete example is New York City, uh, right, had a new law that took effect in July 2023. Uh, that is, uh, again, more focused on the use of AI tools in employment decisions, uh, but it is already in place. and. Uh, for those that follow this space, um, you know, from a U.S. perspective, uh, there are state laws, uh, you know, state laws also being proposed elsewhere throughout the U.S., um, as well as uh, a fair amount of activity, uh, for example, with the, uh, you know, the White House commitments that were announced. And also the terms of the EU AI Act, right, were more to come on that, but uh, were agreed upon in December 2023. So here at IBM, uh, you know, we, you know, we did a lot of work uh, to get ready for GDPR um, in 2018 and really our focused, uh, our model is on continuous compliance, uh, a continuous compliance approach that uh, really uh, prepares us well for regulation, um, regulation driven changes and emerging regulations. So I'm just going to uh, spend a minute here uh, talking about IBM's integrated governance program. And uh, this is our target operating model uh, as it relates to AI. And uh, this particular topic is covered in this page and the next page. And what I would say here at the outset is uh, the relationship between data pipelines, intended use cases, uh, life cycle of model development, uh, it really is a complex governance uh, challenge and 
um, at IBM, our integrated governance program, our model, uh, is really uh, focused on driving to a single program with a high level of accountability uh, to help us ensure that we keep pace with future requirements of the business. And, uh, you know, again, this is our target operating model. We not there yet, but uh, we are rapidly working towards that. And, uh, but it really is, the purpose of this is to really show, um, you know, where we are headed and also the um, interrelationship that exists uh, between the different uh, parts of this. So you have on the left-hand side, um, right, our AI ethics board, right, which handles use case review, sets policy standards, um, guardrails. Um, and then on the right-hand side, uh, you have our AI system model build. So uh, guidance from the AI ethics board, right, feeds into our model uh, build. Uh, we have a data a governance data clearance process. So uh, you may have data acquisition uh, that uh, you know goes through this data governance and data uh, clearance process. Uh, then you're getting to the level of your products, right? Where um, you know there's model lifecycle management. So there's fine tuning that goes on. Uh, and then when the model and data is cleared, uh, turning to the next slide. Um, you know, it gets it gets tracked right in uh, our integrated system, right? Where we have a global asset inventory uh, that, in fact, tracks um, again our uses of AI. Uh, you know, this uh, ties into our uh, management of data privacy as well. Um, you know, so there's the question of whether the asset is an AI system. Uh, and then also whether the asset, uh, you know, controls or manages personal uh, information, right? So there is, uh, that would trigger a privacy assessment. Uh, being an algorithmic system would uh, trigger an AIA. Um, and then again, uh, you know, those would be evaluated for compliance with regulatory uh, requirements. I'm just so, uh, I only have a few minutes left. Uh, just to say that IBM is very uh, active on the global stage. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we have a technology ethics lab with the University of Notre Dame, uh, really supporting um, applied and inter interdisciplinary research uh, projects that are focused on core tech ethics questions. Uh, we're very involved with a number of other organizations, such as the IAPP. Uh, Christina Montgomery, our chief privacy office, uh, is, was named to NIAC. Uh, and also the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So we, you know, we really are uh, engaged on thought uh, leadership uh, on the global stage. Uh, just some recent examples. Uh, we did sign uh, the White House AI commitments uh, to advance the development of safe, secure, and trustworthy AI. Uh, we were we participated in the UK AI Summit. Uh, we are have supported various U.S. regulatory initiatives around AI, uh, including uh, U.S. Senator Charles Schumer's AI Insight Forum last September. Uh, as well as participated in Singapore's AI Verify International Pilot. Um, here on this next slide, I've just included a slide with our policies. The paper I had referred to earlier, Foundation Models, Opportunities, Risks, and Mitigations. And here, I just, uh, as we close out uh, the uh, my presentation portion uh, of this event, I, I just wanted to leave uh, a few uh, points that could be uh, really walkaways uh, for different organizations who are, you know, perhaps starting or at a different point uh, in their journey uh, in managing uh, AI uh, uses. So. Uh, one key point would be to decide and drive the AI strategy for the organization. Uh, this could include, uh, you know, a leadership team, a board, a steering committee, uh, establishing values and principles for the organization at IBM. Again, uh, one of our uh, principles is trust and transparency. Uh, just, just develop a policy based on how 
on how these principles apply to AI, um, develop clear and transparent reporting mechanisms and checkpoints to assess actual compliance uh, and report back. And uh, the last thing I would cover uh, here is just to, again, it's important to consider the full AI system life cycle. Uh, so, uh, you know, yes, enable transparent data collection and reporting out the gate, but it's important uh, to manage it throughout the lifestyle, life so excuse me, life cycle and ensure the continued uh, monitoring of the AI tools because things like drift, um, you know, can occur, uh, you know, bias could show up at some point in time. So it's important to uh, monitor that and, uh, you know, track and adjust as needed. So I, the only other slides I have um, really are uh, some toolkits that are generally available to others and some resources uh, where you might want to learn more. Um, with that, um, Vicki, I will turn it back to you uh, to open it up for share questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much. Um, and anyone that would like a copy of these, uh, a PDF of these slides, we'd be happy to share these with you um, after the event. So just request that. Um, so as a reminder, audience, you can still ask questions. And we're going to take a couple of questions that come already came in. Um, this, the first two are kind of similar, and that they talk about the importance of governance, but ensuring innovation. This one asks, does IBM have some type of SLA in place to ensure that this process doesn't stall, impact again, impacting the speed of innovation? Ah, like a service level agreement internally. Um, you know, I wouldn't say we have a formal uh, SLA. I mean, it's a good question. I, you know, but I, I, I recognize and I, I want to emphasize there is, um, you know, innovation is moving quickly, right? So, um, you know, moving with speed uh, matters, right? Um, I mean, to date, uh, we haven't had an issue. Uh, you know, I, I will share, right, sometimes use cases come in, right, and uh, perhaps they're client specific, right, so uh, we do have to move quickly, right, because um, we need to get back to the client, um, you know, and really as we build out our processes, right, I mean, I shared, again, kind of our, our target in terms of integrated governance, uh, you know, we're trying to uh, automate things, right, to the extent possible uh, with that end goal in mind. Thank you for that. And then the next question is, what was the AI ethics by design methodology based upon? So now, right, <laughs> now we're, we're getting beyond, um, when you say based upon, like, what did we pull from for purposes of developing it? Um, you know, that particular piece of the puzzle, uh, uh, we have some data scientists, right, who were really actively involved in that. And I mean, I, I could give somewhat of a high level picture, but probably not uh, in the level of detail, right, that you're really asking. So you're, you're kind of, I think the question, or maybe we could get clarification is, um, you know, how, how did we connect all of the dots? I mean, is that kind of the question? That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Well, at a high level, I'll share um, within our, ch our chief privacy office, we have a group that's responsible for tracking uh, emerging regulations, right, and uh, what those re regulations require, right? So that is an important feeder into ethics by design, um, you know, is understanding like existing and emerging requirements uh, and making sure the that you operationalize complying with those. And then separate from that, we have our pillars and principles, right, which um, are, you have regulation and then you have our ethical uh, approach to AI, uh, which also uh, would influence ethics by design. Thank you. Question. <laughs> um, uh, I think we have time for one more, and it says great and well reasoned strategy and principles. Are you finding any conflicts between adherence to these principles and the desire and need to quickly progress through technical innovations? Again, that's the innovation question. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I mean, again, there has been a lot. I'll share with this audience, right? A lot. Like 2023, um, you know, just was like full speed ahead. A lot of different 
issues of first impression, I would say, that have arisen. Um, and I, I don't think it's impacted our speed, but certainly uh, it has uh, engendered dialogue, right, internally, right, as certain issues come up, and engendered dialogue and uh, really navigating, guided by our principles and pillars, right, what is the, you know, the path forward, what are the guardrails that are needed, are there changes that are needed, right, um, and that, you know, it, it does, again, I, I haven't seen an impact in terms of, uh, how shall I say, slowing down the business, but I, I do understand the sentiment, right, because, um, you know, things move quickly and any kind of review takes time. Uh, but I, I really feel like we are uh, striking uh, the right path there. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for such a wonderful keynote. And thank you to um, everyone else for joining us today for this, for this session and all of our session. All uh, This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Um, this does officially conclude the Argyle CIO Leadership Forum. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Adobe, for their support of today's event. And thank you again for joining us today and engaging in this content. Thank you again, Catherine. And thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.